Hello and welcome to We On Live broadcast from London. I'm Giles Gibson. Let's take a look at your latest headlines. Britain's new Chancellor Jeremy Hunt reverses almost all of the tax cuts announced by his predecessor and is scaling back support on energy bills. Russian forces carry out attacks on military targets and energy infrastructure across Ukraine using high-precision weapons. Sweden's parliament elects right-wing Prime Minister Ulf Kristersson after three centre-right parties agreed to support the Sweden Democrats. The EU prepares to slap sanctions on Iran over its crackdown on anti-government protests. And rapper Kanye West is set to buy conservative social media platform Parler. We begin here in the UK and within days of being brought in as the new Chancellor of the Exchequer, Jeremy Hunt has scaled back the government's energy bill support scheme and he's also reversed nearly all of the tax cuts in the so-called mini-budget which was unveiled by his predecessor Kwasi Kwarteng last month. Hunt says UK Prime Minister Liz Truss has agreed that it would be wrong to make such a long-term spending commitment on energy bills when it's unclear what will happen to prices in the future. He says there will then be a review and a more targeted system will be put in place. The announcement leaves Liz Truss's initial economic strategy in tatters. I have therefore decided to keep the increase in corporation tax that was planned by the previous government. Now, for more on this, our correspondent Alex Izat is joining us live from London. Alex, just walk us through what's still left from that mini budget that was announced by Kwasi Kwarteng and what's been taken out. Well, we were expecting to hear about a lot of the reversal of the cuts as they actually haven't gone through Parliament yet. So they're not in legislation. So we were expecting them. We weren't expecting, though, to keep the stamp duty, although I do understand that that actually has gone to the first step towards getting that legislation. And hence, that's why it's being kept. But the 1p uh, cut rate is gone. National insurance is staying. And so we weren't so surprised about what we were hearing because the markets were completely spooked when uh, the former chancellor had his mini budget. And again, they weren't calming at all when he had his new 45p cut, uh, tax cut. So what we weren't expecting, though, was this huge change about the energy price cuts. Now, we were expecting that to go on for two years. And in fact, Liz Truss had her whole platform based around these tax cuts about the energies and helping with the cost of living for the next two years. And any time she was questioned, she did say that she was going to be helping the people of the United Kingdom, specifically bringing up the fact that she had got in place that there's going to be this price freeze and there's going to be a cap. But Jeremy Hunt today said, well, no, actually, it's only going to be until April. And then we're going to check the volatility of the markets because ultimately, Ultimately, he was saying that we can't keep borrowing. We need that money. It needs to come from somewhere. And of course, he mentioned that the tax uh, taxes that will still be implemented that were on not just uh, Boris Johnson's government, but were suggested by Rishi Sunak, that may be bring in about 32 billion pounds to the economy, which is desperately needed, which is comparison to the former chancellor who said that it's likely we may be borrowing up to 60 billion pounds. So it does seem that the markets had a little 
not potentially sigh of relief, but they were now trying to figure out what is the next step. We didn't get any real in-depth into a lot of the other changes. He, Jeremy Hunt did mention that he was going to be speaking at Parliament later today. And also he said that he's made a lot of decisions. So it's quite interesting, really, when we look at what he said and how he said it, that he does seem to be de facto in charge in this statement. He came off quite professionally as well. So it would be for people watching from outside if they didn't know Liz Truss as our Prime Minister, potentially that they would have thought that Jeremy Hunt was speaking on her behalf for the whole country. And Alex, as you mentioned, we've seen Liz Truss having to sack her Chancellor within the first month of her being office. Uh, she's now having to make a complete U-turn on her economic strategy. How precarious is her situation right now? Well, there is a civil war going on within the Conservative Party membership, and it's not being behind closed doors. Four MPs now have come out and they said they want Liz Truss gone. A hundred backbenchers of the Tory parties apparently have written a letter that they want to try and oust her. The, the question is, what exactly does she now bring? She kept on doubling down from the very moment that she got into the winning contest that she was doing all this for energy, to help cost of living, but she was really into economic growth and she was really behind all of these changes to all of the taxes. So she kept on doubling down on that. And now that Jeremy Hunt has come out and has made very much sweeping changes, even to her backbone policy with the price freeze itself, what is this trust's purpose? Really, she doesn't seem to be in charge. She is going to be speaking to the cabinet members later. Supposedly, she had a conversation at 10 a.m. with some of her members. But it does seem that she has lost a lot of control. And if she does get ousted, she will be the shortest prime minister in history. But of course, there are all these factions that are going on within the Tory parties aren't actually doing the Conservatives any favours themselves. They may be trying to speak up for the constituents who want more answers to their questions. What exactly is going to be done with the cost of living? When do we know that taxes are going to come down? What about inflation? What about mortgages? What about market rates? But ultimately, they are giving Labour a great chance of potentially winning and also potentially calling a general election. And if that general election does happen, any time within the next couple of months, the polls suggest that Labour will be the ones that get into power. So they should be quite careful, the, the members who are speaking out against this trust. What did they really see happening? If they keep arguing they didn't want Boris Johnson, they got rid of him, then now they don't list, want this trust. So are they going to keep doing this? Are they ever going to be content with any prime minister that comes in? They do really need to be careful whether or not this trust is going to be able to even push a single one of her policies forward. We have to think about the wider implications for the Conservative Party. All right, thanks for that, Alex. That was Alex Isaac reporting live for us from the UK capital. Meanwhile, as we heard from Alex there, Conservative Party lawmakers could reportedly try to oust Prime Minister Liz Truss later this week. More than 100 Tory MPs have reportedly submitted or are ready to submit letters of no confidence to Graham Brady MP. He's the head of the 1922 Committee of Backbench Conservative MPs. Multiple media reports say that the MPs will urge Brady to tell Truss that her time is up or to change the Conservative Party rules to allow an immediate vote of confidence in her leadership. Truss is fighting for her political survival after ditching key parts of her economic programme. Her party has also fallen way behind the opposition Labour Party in opinion polls here in the UK. So, if Liz Truss is pushed out, who would be the potential candidates to succeed her as the Conservatives and the UK's fifth Prime Minister since the 2016 Brexit referendum and the third since Boris Johnson's massive election victory just back in 2019? Well, Rishi Sunak, who is the Indian origin MP who lost to Liz Truss in the final round of the race for the Tory leadership, he remains the top choice for several party MPs. In August, Rishi Sunak criticised Truss's economic strategy, claiming it would lead 
to misery for millions. There's also Ben Wallace, the UK Defence Secretary. Now, he decided not to run for leader in the summer, despite getting signals of some pretty significant grassroots backing. There's also the leader of the House of Commons, Penny Mordaunt. She's another name that you are hearing bandied around inside Westminster behind closed doors at the moment. And then, of course, there is Boris Johnson, the former UK Prime Minister, who led the Conservative Party to a resounding win in 2019. He, of course, was forced to step down after the Partygate scandal and then mass resignations from within his own cabinet. Well, for more on this, let's cross to Dr Nigel Fletcher, who's a political historian at King's College London, and he's joining us live. Uh, Dr Fletcher, could you just explain to us uh, the rules of the 1922 committee and how this push to try and get Liz Truss out of office could be very, very different to what we saw uh, just months ago with Boris Johnson? Yes, good afternoon. Um it is different to what we saw a few months ago, not least because with a leader who is uh, only recently in office, they normally have uh, a year's immunity uh, from the no confidence procedure that we're familiar with, increasingly familiar with now, of letters being submitted to Graham Brady uh, calling for um, a vote. Normally, they're not able to do that for the first year that the leader is, is in office. Um, and so in order to get over that, there would need to be a change in the rules uh, to allow a contest to take place, if that's the way Conservative MPs want to go. Graham Brady has said previously, when uh, issues came up, for example, after Boris Johnson won uh, the uh, leadership uh, no confidence vote that was called earlier this year when he had a year's immunity uh, Graham Brady um, had said previously that if it got to the point where he had so many letters coming in that a uh, majority of the parliamentary party were against the prime minister he would go and have a, a word with them and say look you don't have the confidence of the parliamentary party so I think that the rules obviously are set out um, you know, say that, that that can't happen. In reality, if the political will is there and the parliamentary party demonstrably has no confidence in the prime minister, then Graham Brady acting as their spokesperson would go to the prime minister uh, and tell them that. And so we would expect to see uh, that happen and the prime minister then being advised to resign. Uh, if she didn't, then I think we would then have to look at the option. They would have to change the rules and then they'd have to go through a no confidence vote, uh, at which point she would be forced out. Sir Graham Brady, of course, being the, the chairman of the backbench Conservative MPs committee, the 1922 committee. What do you see Liz Truss having to do in the next few days, perhaps, in, in order to try to shore up her support amongst her own MPs? Well, it's very difficult to see how she can recover the, uh, the sort of confidence that she would need to convince uh, MPs that she's the person to take this forward. As we've heard, her entire economic uh, plan, not just the one that was set out at the budget, but of course that was based on her pitch to the Conservative Party members. So her entire platform was based around this plan of cutting taxes uh, and of borrowing uh, in order to pay for it. As you pointed out, Rishi Sunak had said during the leadership election that he thought that would be disastrous. He thought that was the wrong thing to do. Uh, and he offered quite a, a, a harsh critique of that policy. You can say that he actually has been proved in that uh, correct, and that's what a lot of MPs are saying, and which is why he's being talked up as being a, a potential replacement. Um, in order for her to recover credibility, I think what she's doing now is trying to demonstrate that she's able to uh, to be flexible, uh, to put it mildly, uh, by uh, committing these, these sorts of um, uh, changes. And in fact, we've seen messages going out in the last hour or so from her and from um, the, the party leadership saying they've had to adjust their plan. Well, this is not an adjustment. This is a complete reversal of the entire platform on which Liz Truss um, stood for, for being leader. So the idea that this afternoon in Parliament she can sit there alongside her new Chancellor um, whilst he completely dismantles her entire economic platform uh, and nodding along to that is, is very difficult. Um, it, it does uh, look as though she is, as the phrase goes, in office but not in power. She doesn't have 
any part of her platform on the economic front uh, still in place. Even the thing that she talked about most in the last few weeks um, on the energy um, price freeze, that's now been, to some extent, dismantled as well and been limited to only the next six months. So there's almost nothing left of what she uh, stood for and what she put in that uh, mini budget alongside her now former chancellor. So it's very difficult to see what she can do. The only thing I suppose she can do um, is to say that all of the main decisions now are being taken by her chancellor and she will focus on uh, sort of steering the ship as a, as a sort of, uh, as some, someone put it over the weekend, as the chairman of the, um, of the board rather than as an executive. But that's not really how politics works. People expect the prime minister to be the one in charge. Yeah, we're going to be watching this very closely over the next few days or so. Thank you very much for that. That was uh, Dr. Nigel Fletcher from King's College London joining us with some analysis on the uh, political and economic turmoil that we're seeing here in the UK right now. Well, let's, let's shift our focus now to the war in Ukraine. And Russia has attacked the center of Kiev with drones during the morning rush hour. Russian forces also shelling other cities around the country over the last few hours or so. According to the Ukrainian interior minister, several people have been killed in Russian strikes on Ukrainian cities. According to the Ukrainian government, attacks were carried out by Iranian-made what they described as suicide drones. The country's military says it's destroyed 37 of those drones since Sunday evening. Russia's defense ministry says it carried out a, quote, massive attack on military targets and energy infrastructure across Ukraine using high precision weapons. The new wave of Russian drone attacks in Kiev forced people to scramble for cover during the morning rush hour for the second successive week. Ukrainian military officials showed journalists a fragment of a drone that they say was used in an attack on Kiev. And written on that fragment were the words for Belgorod. That's a Russian region bordering Ukraine that's been hit by shelling recently. Meanwhile, in the Ukrainian port city of Mykolaiv, Russian kamikaze drones hit uh, storage tanks for sunflower oil at one of the port's terminals. The attack taking place hours before explosions broke out in the capital, Kiev, from suspected Iranian-made drones. Mykolaiv, which is located near to the Russian-occupied Kherson region, has been under constant shelling in recent months. Ukraine is conducting a counter-offensive to try to push Russian troops out of the city of Kherson. And now Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky says that heavy fighting is going on around two towns in the eastern Donbass region. Take a listen. The situation on the front line has not changed significantly over the last day. The key hotspots in Donbass are Solda and Bakhmut. Very heavy fighting is going on there. The invaders threw everyone they could against our forces, including 2,000 criminals. They are among the mercenaries there. And these are prisoners with long prison terms for serious crimes. They are kept at the front not only by offering money, but also by the promise of amnesty. Stay connected with the world through
information is a key management tool that farmers that are under protected cropping have to manage and this research is trying to allow them to do that more effectively, more efficiently and reduce their input costs. week on South Asia Diary, women in Afghanistan rally against deadly school bombing, demand equal access to education. A month after the deadly floods, Pakistanis return to their homes in shambles. 130 million were left in the dark after Bangladesh's power systems go into major failure and a unique environment-savvy project that converts cigarette butts to soft toys. All this and more, only on We On World Is One. This week on Wild of Africa, raging floods and devastating droughts. The continent is battered by effects of climate change, leaving thousands reeling in desperation even as Egypt's COP27 climate summit nears. Lesotho decides. Southern Africa's smallest country heads to the polls amid impasse on constitutional reforms and political instability. And boost to Morocco's cannabis trade as the state agency issues the first 10 permits for the use of the hub in medicine and for export. Wild of Africa at this time, only on We On, Wild is One. This week on the West Asia Post. A rift is brewing between the U.S. and the Gulf states. We On speaks exclusively to Lebanon's deputy speaker, Elias Boussab, on the country's historic deal with Israel. Iraqi lawmakers elect a new president. Let's cross back over to Europe now. And in Paris, tens of thousands of protesters have marched to express their frustration at the rising cost of living. This coming three weeks into a refinery strike that's caused fuel sh shortages right across France. The demonstration was called by the left-wing political opposition and led by the head of the France Unbowed or LFI party, Jean-Luc Mélenchon. According to reports, security forces fired tear gas on several occasions after they were pelted with objects. Some protesters wore yellow fluorescent vests. That was the symbol of the often violent anti-government protests back in 2018 that rocked the first term of French President Emmanuel Macron. Mélenchon has also called for a general strike on Tuesday. Some, but not all, trade unions have already declared the date a national day of strikes targeting road transport, trains and also the public sector. Organizers, organizers sorry, claimed almost 140,000 people attended that march in Paris. The strikes and protests are being closely watched by the government, which is aiming to pass a highly controversial change to the pension system over the next few months. Macron, who won re-election back in April, has pledged to push back the retirement age in France from its current level of 62. Police in the British city of Manchester have launched an investigation after a Hong Kong pro-democracy protester was allegedly beaten up on the premises of the Chinese consulate. The alleged incident took place on Sunday when democracy supporters were protesting outside the Chinese consulate in Manchester. Visuals circulating on social media show police officers trying to rein in chaotic scenes Another viral video shows a protester appearing to be dragged into the consulate grounds. Oh, 
The incident has already been condemned by several British politicians. Uh, former Tory leader Ian Duncan Smith called on the Chinese embassy in the UK to issue a full apology over the incident. He also demanded the expulsion of the officials who could have been involved. Labour MP Andrew Gwynn, meanwhile, has also spoken out on social media, calling it unacceptable and against the provisions of the joint declaration to uphold democratic rights and freedoms. Greater Manchester Police say they've launched an investigation to determine exactly what took place in, on Sunday, while police patrols have also been ramped up in the area to try to reassure the surrounding community. The incident came on the same day when Chinese President Xi Jinping hailed victory in Hong Kong. That was during the opening address at the Chinese Party National Congress in Beijing. He's, he claimed that Hong Kong has successfully transitioned from chaos to governance and is being administered by what he described as a patriot. And finally, just before we go, Harry Styles' tour has witnessed some pretty dramatic moments. First, a chicken nugget was thrown onto the stage as he was performing. And now the singer's concert in Chicago has seen a bottle being thrown at the pop star. Thanks for watching. We'll leave you with these visuals. It's very unseasonable. Okay, shake it off. Okay. Well done.